Hey everybody, this is a webcast for Psych 260 or Learning and Plasticity and I'm going to talk to you today about motor skill learning and I have a list through my own research of five tips that I came up with to help you in motor skill learning. So motor skills are basically just body movements like you know you learning to throw a frisbee or shoot a jump shot or you know more technically difficult like high jumping or hurdling those are all motor skills that through practice you learn for your sport. So in my opinion there's two kinds of athletes that exist in professional sports. There's guys like a LeBron James that are very athletic, they're fast runners, they're high jumpers, they're giant guys. And then there's guys like Steve Nash that are on the smaller side, they're not as fast, but both have, you know, become NBA NBA MVP and the guys like Steve Nash have relied more on their ball handling ability or their technical skill. So the focus of this webcast is going to be more to prepare you to be a player like Steve Nash or you know someone else who relies on this technique not so much making you physically bigger stronger faster and that's not to say that those aren't important parts of sport but the research that I focused on the learning aspect led me to more of a more of this avenue so my own experience in uh, motor skill learning is I'm a shot putter discus thrower for the U of T varsity uh, blues team and in my own sport body position and technique and how well I can execute my throw are very important to distance almost as poor, almost as important as you know how strong I can be or how fast I can be so it was this desire that kinda led me to, to do more research into this so before I give you guys my five tips I'm gonna give you a little uh, brain information to help you understand you know just just what I'm talking about so this is kind of a, a rough crude drawing of what kinda goes on in the brain when you're doing something that involves a motor skill or any kind of movement. So picture millions of these throughout the brain. These are neurons, okay? This whole unit right here is a neuron. So it, neurons send signals from one neuron to another neuron throughout the brain and into the body. So the parts of the neuron are this yellow part, which is the cell body right here, which is kind of the brain. It decides whether or not to send signals. Then there's this green and pink part is called the axon, so the axon takes the signal from the cell body and brings it down here to the terminal buttons which are these little orange strands and then the terminal buttons release a chemical called neurotransmitter into this gap called the synapse right here okay so these little dots are neurotransmitter so the dendrite which is this purple branch on the other neuron picks up the neurotransmitter and then the signal goes to the another, another neuron and then it's transferred further to the next neuron in the chain and so on and so forth so if I can just zoom in right here on this little gap, this synapse right here, it would kind of look like it would kind of look like this, okay? So this is my terminal button. This is my dendrite. So these vesicles that have the neurotransmitters in them, they go to the end of the terminal button and they release the neurotransmitter chemical into the synapse and it binds to receptors on the dendrite which let particles go in and basically send the message to the next neuron. So uh, when you have these going on in your brain, basically what you what you want to do to improve your skill learning is find a way to make these fire faster, make them fire more frequently, and to make them fire more efficiently. So that when you send signals around in your brain, they basically get there as fast as possible and as efficiently as possible. So with that in mind, I'm going to just jump right into my tips. Tip number one is that mental is as good as physical for practice. Now before you get all excited and think that you don't ever have to you know, pick up a basketball or run on the track again, I want to clarify that physical practice is important for building the muscular anatomy that you want to do your sport. However, for skill learning, and for skill learning only, mental practice is as good as physical practice in that it's the same to your brain. Now what this means is that when you imagine yourself performing a skill, your brain is firing, or meaning your brain areas are active in the same areas that would be active if you were performing that skill just in a physical state. So I found a study that proved this through uh, testing participants using hand motion. So the participants would just try to move their hands or just trace them in simple motions. And then the participants would also imagine themselves doing these exact same movements. And when the participants had their brain scans while doing both the imaginary side of the experiment and the physical side of the experiment, their brain activation was actually the same. So the brain areas that were active in the participants were 
the primary motor cortex, which is right here. And what that does is it's basically, it helps you um, coordinate your movements. So if your primary motor cortex, you want to move your hand, your primary motor cortex sends that signal. And then also the supplementary motor area and the premotor cortex, which are, signal, which are um, parts of your brain that integrate signals from all over the brain and feed into the primary motor cortex to help it make decisions. So the way that you can use this knowledge in your own sports training is that if you can't make it out to practice that day or if you're hurt or you know if it's raining or your conditions aren't ideal you can not lose a day of practice by practicing the skills that you need for your sport in your mind. Now a good way to do this is to relax your body and to really pay attention to the physical experience of performing that skill. So for example if I'm in a, a soccer player and I'm running out on the field I'm going to imagine how my cleats feel on my feet. I'm going to imagine how the wind feels as I run. I'm going to imagine how the sun feels, what sounds I'm hearing, you know, what sights I'm seeing. The more realistic you can make it for yourself, the better visualization is going to work for you. So my second tip is that if you're in a reactive sport, practice different things. So the study evidence that I have to back this claim up was found in a study where there was basically three conditions. So in the first condition, rats were in what they called a high learning environment. So they had a lot of acrobatic like apparatuses in the in their cage where they could practice, you know, walking on beams or going up and down things. But it was basically a different environment with a lot of um, bright colors, different stuff for the rats to interact with. The second condition had uh, only a wheel in the rats' learning environment, and the third condition was a control condition where it was just a blank cage. So. Um, in this uh, experiment, once the rats were dead, they examined their brains and they found in the cerebellum area that rats who lived in the high learning environment with the different apparatuses to interact with had more synaptogenesis in their cerebellum. So we can go back right here to my little diagram. This yellow guy right here at the bottom is your cerebellum, so it's a brain structure that's involved with um, motor planning, motor coordination, adjusting skills. So if you're trying to walk on an uneven surface and you're kind of shaky, then your cerebellum will tell, will realize that the signal to walk smoothly is not being carried out and will make adjustments. So the cerebellum is it's an important uh, structure in your brain for carrying out skills. So in this structure, in these rats that grew up in this environment, the researchers found that there was more synaptogenesis, which means the dendrites from neurons actually grew more connections to different neurons. So what this means for you as an athlete is that if you practice a sport where you have to make decisions or just basically be in different situations, kind of like the rats who are in different situations in their learning environment, it's best to practice a lot of different situations. So if you're an ultimate frisbee player and you know that in a game you might have to make you know five different kinds of passes and there might be different types of zone coverage, they might cover you man to man, you should practice for all these situations when you're actually learning your skills. And this is because the more you practice these different skills, the more synapses will be created in your brain, which is the more sites for neurons to, to, to communicate over these movement patterns. So if you have more synapses for more movement patterns when you come to the game, you will be more prepared and you'll be able to execute more efficiently in different, um, in different situations. So for example, if I don't practice passing under somebody's arm in a, and then I get to a game and I have to pass under somebody's arm, the synapse won't be there, the neurotransmission path won't be there. So I'll still be able to do the movement, but it won't be as efficient for me as if I had practiced that and I had a synapse in my brain that could actually fire and carry out that movement. So tip 2B is if you're in a stereotype sport, practice the same things. So. Uh, evidence for this claim also came from the rat study and it came from the condition where the rats were in the environment with only the exercise wheel. And what researchers found was that rather than synaptogenesis, which is you know more of these connections, dendrite to terminal button connections, what actually these rats showed was more angiogenesis in the cerebellum, which again is this guy right here. So angiogenesis is nothing to do with dendrites, it's actually the growth of new blood vessels in the brain. So brain areas need blood and the more blood vessels you have in a brain area the better supply of blood you can get there, the more blood you can get there, the more efficiently you can get blood there. So for these rats 
what it meant to have more blood vessels was that they were able to more efficiently run on the exercise wheel. So if you're in a stereotype sport, you're not really needing new uh, synapses to deal with new novel you know, situations you're going to come into when you compete. If I'm a 100 meter runner, I'm always running 100 meters. Barring someone else running into my lane, there's no you know, new situation I'm ever going to have to deal with, nothing I'm going to need new synapses for. So if you're in a sport like you know track and field or gymnastics or figure skating where it's individual, it's better for you to practice your competition movement over and over again so you can have the angiogenesis in the cerebellum to improve your movement of that sport. So if I'm in the discus circle and I've you know practiced over and over and over and over again my discus spin, my, I'm going to have the blood vessels in the brain areas in the cerebellum that I need to improve my to, to perform my movement as efficiently as possible. So my third tip is my only dietary tip, but it's on the list for a very good reason. Eating fish is good because it contains a substance called eicosapentaenoic acid, or EPA. And what makes EPA so special is that it helps to create the myelin sheath in the brain. So if I can go back to my little neuron diagram here, on each neuron there's this, there's a axon. So the axon is this green and pink part right here. So if I zoom in on the axon, I'm going to end up with this. So this is, this is the cell body, these are your dendrites, and this right here is your axon. So myelin is this pink stuff right here, and what it does is it acts as an insulator for electrical signals that go from the cell body to the dendrites. So if you picture your, your axon like an electric cord, myelin is the rubber that wraps around it. So the bigger and thicker and stronger the rubber is, the better electricity is going to be conducted down the electrical cord to get to wherever it's going. Just so in the brain, if there's more myelin, then the signals are going to be stronger and there's going to be less loss of signal strength as it goes down the sheath. So I'm not saying that eating fish is going to build you know, super strong myelin sheaths that are going to make your brain supercharged and you're going to be able to learn skills way faster. But what I am saying is eating fish is going to give you the tools that you need to build these sheaths should you use them in the brain. Now, myelin sheath degradation is uh, actually a common part of a, a disease called multiple cirrhosis and it involves motor impairments for those who have it because the signals are being lost as they go along the axon because the myelin isn't there to insulate them. Okay, tip number four takes us out of the dietary tips and back into the practice tips. So the tip is, if your skill is hard, make it easy, and if your skill is easy, make it hard. So to help you understand this concept, which might seem a little confusing at first, I've created for you the continuum of skill difficulty. So on this end is what I consider probably the easiest skill we have, which is breathing, and on this end is what I consider one of the hardest skills in sports, which is the quadruple axle in figure skating. So unless you're a professional breather, or you're a professional figure skater, your skill usually lies somewhere along this axis. So when I say an easy skill or a hard skill, I mean a skill that in executing is fairly quick to pick up, a skill that doesn't you don't have a lot of take a lot of practice to master to be closer to this side, and a skill that you know requires continual work or pays very special attention to technique to be closer to this side. So if you have a skill on this easy side of the spectrum, it's best for you to make practice conditions tougher on yourself than they would be in your actual competition. So a study that looked at these skills found that the easier a skill gets for you, the better you get at it because your reaction time improves, it requires less um, demand on your attention, your, your physical body changes to learn that skill. But from a mental perspective, if you can perform the skill competently, but then get to a game situation or a competition situation and environmental factors change like sounds, sights, you know, you, you have an opponent in your face, it can be more difficult to perform that skill. So what this study suggested was that if you have a skill that is, is very easy and you've mastered it, to make practice conditions, you know, tougher than, tougher than a game situation so that when you get to the game situation, your, your mind is able to handle the load that is placed on it and you are able to perform the skill effectively. Now on the other side of the spectrum, if you're back here, you know, with a difficult skill like your quadruple axle or, you know, a gymnastics routine, 
And what you want to do is you want to make it easy for yourself in practice. So practicing a skill that's difficult, if you haven't mastered it, and then adding extra cognitive demands to yourself in practice, like you know the sound of the crowd or, or competition, is not going to facilitate learning the skill. And what this study suggested was that it's better to just practice learning the skill, and when you get to competition, kind of hope everything goes right, rather than try to make it more difficult, not learn the skill as well anyways, and then get to competition and practice a less beneficial skill. So what the results from the study are saying for you in practice is if you have a skill that you've mastered and you're comfortable with it, make, make it harder. Try to make it a hard skill again. Make it something that takes more work for you to master. If you have a skill that you're working hard at and it takes continual effort and you know input to improve, try to make it as easy for yourself as possible so you can learn to master the skill. So it's kind of like a cycle that repeats itself. As soon as something gets easy, you want to make it hard again. And as soon as something gets hard, you want to kind of take it back easy until you can learn it again to make it easy. All right, guys, so tip number five is that feedback is a walking stick and not a crutch. So what this means is that feedback, which is like the information that you get whenever you perform a skill in practice, is not supposed to be doing your thinking for you. So if I have a coach and I'm trying to throw a frisbee and I'm trying to make the frisbee you know, fly smoothly and the coach is telling me everything that I know about the feel of throwing the frisbee, then it's not going to be as beneficial for me as if he tells me some things that I may not notice, but I understand how to perform the skill myself through practicing it. So that's where the crutch versus walking stick comes in. A walking stick is there to help you balance every once in a while, and it's nice to have in an emergency, but it's not a crutch, which is you know to take the weight off whatever leg you've hurt and to do your work for you. So the study which kind of showed this fact involved hand movements again and it showed that basically in the two conditions the first condition participants that were doing this hand movement task received feedback on how they were doing on every trial so that means if they were doing it right they were told you know right okay if you're doing it wrong here's where you went wrong and then in the other condition they received feedback on every number of trials so not every trial every block of trials they would receive feedback and what the results found was that the, the space feedback for a simple hand movement skill was actually better for improvement of sport. So what this means for you in your training is that if you have a skill that's you know fairly simple like shooting a basketball or kicking a soccer ball it's good to get feedback once in a while but if you have someone breaking down your technique on every repetition it's not going to be as good for you to learn the skill because a lot of what, it, what is involved in those simpler skills is your own personal feeling. Now the second part of the study is that if you are learning a difficult skill, it is good to have feedback on every trial. So this same study looked at a group that was learning to do alpine skiing. So basically in alpine skiing, when you're doing your technique, the further you can get from center with your feet, this little line right here, the better you're performing the technique. So what these studies found was that since this technique is very difficult, getting feedback on every trial actually did help more than getting feedback on, on every number of trials or in trial blocks. So what this means for those of you that have a very difficult tech, technical sport, you know, such as gymnastics or you know, um, throwing the discus or doing hurdles or pole vaulting, it's good to have feedback on every trial because there are aspects of that movement that are too difficult for you to keep in mind at one time. So having feedback lets you you know, see, see the parts of the movement that you normally wouldn't notice and it helps you keep your technique more in line. Okay guys, those are my five tips for skill learning. I hope you guys found something useful. Just to go over them really quickly again, mental practice is as good as physical practice. So learn the skills in your mind and they will help you when you perform them in a game. My second skill is if you're in a reactive sport, practice different movements. If you're in a stereotype sport, practice the same movement. So if you have to make decisions in a game, practice making decisions in practice. If you don't have to make decisions in your competition and you're just doing the one movement, just practice the one movement and your brain will get better accordingly. Tip number three is eat fish. So you want to get that good EPA, which is going to help your brain myelinate those axons so that you have more efficient transmission of signals from neuron to neuron, which is going to help your performance. 
Tip number four is make it easy if it's hard and make it hard if it's easy. So if you've mastered a skill, make it harder for yourself in practice so it's easier for you to perform it in a game. Whereas if you're learning a skill and it's difficult, make it as easy as you can to learn that skill so you can master it and then move to the easy level. And tip number five is feedback is a walking stick and not a crutch. So it's important to pay attention to how the movements that you have to make in your own sport feel to you where, and get feedback if you don't understand what you're doing wrong or you, can, you can't feel out a movement properly. But if you understand what you're doing, feedback is, is less effective. Okay, thanks.